just a few words about you. Please. Yeah. So welcome all uh, for this uh, today's lecture. Uh, will be taken by Dr. Thomas Lamb. We call him Dr. Tom. Uh, so he is from UK. He is a specialist registrar in infectious diseases. His main area of interest are two things: infectious diseases and snake bite. So that's what brought him here. So we've been working with him for one uh, study. So he's actually a visitor to Medicine One for uh, almost 18 to 19 days. So he's been here for now almost two 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 weeks are getting over, and uh, he's involved in many things, uh, both related to infectious diseases and snake bite and various activities he's been involved. And he's also, uh, as I told you, he's involved in one study, so he's been working on that. So since his area of interest is snake bite, uh, so we'll, we'll all hear from him what's his uh, interest and what work he has done before. Uh, so I'll hand over to Dr. Tom now. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Mohan. Um, Thank you for the introduction. And um, I, it's a real privilege for me to visit. Um, CMC is known all over the world. Um, so it's a, it's a real, uh, it's an honor to be here and have the opportunity to talk. So thank you. Just um, before I move on in this slide, um, this is a picture taken from the WHO website. And it's from a page that sort of tries to demonstrate excellent practice and community engagement. It's a particular page that draw upon the experience of CMC Valor in going out to communities to de demonstrate good practice, both with um, uh, snake bite avoidance and first aid. And I want to demonstrate, I, I included this picture, A, because it's a beautiful picture, and B, because um, I'm not here to, I'm also here to learn. So forgive me, um, many of the things I will say today, you will already know. I've not included the very basics about management of snake bite because I, I know that you will be familiar with that. I've tried to draw upon some of the, some of the scenarios you might find yourself on call and thinking, what do I do here? What, what is the evidence underpinning this decision making? And, um, you know, how, how can we optimize the patient in these certain scenarios? So it's, um, I've tried to include plenty of pictures because it's the end of the day. Well, perhaps not for you guys, it is for, <laughs> for me and uh, just to try to keep us all awake. So a few objectives. So we're gonna to touch a bit on first aid, a little bit on the importance of knowing your local snake fauna. Um, we're gonna mention about the assessment of coagulopathy an assessment of neurotoxicity and uh, briefly touch upon when a patient comes, do we need to be giving additional doses of antivenom and when do we stop giving antivenom? And then um, a few slides, a bit about on how I got involved in snake bite, snake bite management, snake bite research, and how you may want to get involved in research, not necessarily snake bite, but any research, because I think it's, um, it's fun. That's ultimately it's fun and it improves our care, the, the, the care that we can deliver. So um, this is a screenshot from a pretty seminal paper on snake bite and venoming in India. And this color uh, sort of uh, the diagram demonstrates that your absolute risk of dying from a snake bite in India before 70 years of age. Now, the, the, the reference is by Sura Weera et al. And it used data from multiple different sources, hospital records, the million death study, uh, which, which again, shed an incredible amount of information on snake bite mortality, and, and also on, um, on a systematic review. So um, the areas in red obviously suggest a higher, higher risk of mortality. There are often rural areas. Um, so perhaps the population density might not be as great, but um, it, it's not, it's, the, the mortality is not seen in one, any one area. It's pretty widely distributed, particularly in the agricultural regions of India. Um, Another finding in this same study suggests that the overall mortality per year from snake bite in India is approximately 60,000. Uh, and that's, uh, combining it all together, that's about half of the mortality in the whole world from snake bite occurs in India, which is 
is astonishing, really. And I know the population of India is pretty high, but um, it doesn't, you know, that is a misrepresentation of the data. India is, um, you know, um, heavily affected by snake bites. Um, now, um, <coughs> Thankfully, the, the World Health Organization now also recognizes it as a neglected tropical diseases. It's a disease of agriculture. It is a disease of, it's an occupational ha ha hazard in rural areas. And for that reason, it perhaps lacks the advocacy. So we, as the clinicians treating snake bites, can be the advocate for this disease. Um, yeah, okay. So, case one. Um, this is a, a little bit about pre-hospital management. So we, we will all be familiar about the, 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 the guidance that we would give to, to communities, potential people that will come and encounter with snakes. Uh, and I was lucky to, enough to observe Annie from Medicine Unit 1 give a wonderful talk. I mean, I couldn't understand it, but she had everyone captivated to, to, uh, uh, to a village on Monday. But uh, the key messages that we try to give across there are to the, to, to the snake bite victim, don't panic. We know that many, many snake bites actually occur from non-venomous snakes, okay? By panicking, increasing your heart rate, raising your blood pressure, that's not going to do uh, any favors for the distribution of venom if you've been envenomed. So don't panic. Even if you know that you've been envenomed by an, uh, even if you know that you've been bitten by a venomous snake, many patients will have received a dry bite. So we, we need to stress upon people, this is not a time to panic. Try to be calm. Um, we need to immobilize that limb. I say limb because of more than 90% of snake bites occur on the limb, mostly on the lower limb, and use a splint if available. Um, arrange immediate transfer to hospital as soon as possible and avoid delay. And that, that is a real key, the key, key point that I want to get, avoid delay. And that in, includes, a, you know, advising against the attendance of traditional healers. But what about the role of tourniquet? What do you in the audience believe about the role of tourniquet? Is a tourniquet good or bad? There's, um, there's actually quite a bit of data that looks at this. Um, not conclusively, I'm, I may add, that actually there, there is a suggestion that having a, a well-applied tourniquet may actually delay the distribution of venom and perhaps may reduce the, the envenoming severity. That's not, it's not, it's not, as I say, it's not a conclusive opinion. And it's, um, it also doesn't um, recognize some of the complications of tourniquet. Um, now, as you'll imagine, an inappropriately, inappropriately applied tourniquet can actually occlude the arterial supply. And then you're um, left with two problems. You're left with the, the, the potential venom within that limb accumulating within the tissue. Uh, and that will augment And the, the, that was bitten by a suspected cobra. They, they weren't able to bring the snake in with them, but the they patient identified the snake as a, as a cobra, an Anaya calthia. And um, the, interestingly, the patient did not develop any neurotoxicity, but they did develop necrosis. And this is many days down the line, reattending clinic for dressing changes. Um, and I believe this probably. Uh, augmented effect of the local cytotoxicity of the of the cobra because of the very tightly applied tourniquet. Just a word um, on tourniquets. If many patients will attend with a tourniquet, that's fine. What I would recommend is when you are releasing the tourniquet, do so in a controlled manner. Do so typically. I would, if if it's available, under um, close observation, because there is a potential for the venom to then distribute as you've released the tourniquet. So um, clearly, if the patient's under your care, they're at CMC. You're in a, you're in a hospital environment. That's great. But if, for example, you're out in the community and you see someone with a tourniquet, that is not the time to release the tourniquet. You keep it in place. 
bring them to hospital, and then we can consider releasing the tourniquet. So um, this is actually something that myself and Dr. Ravika uh, talked about a few days ago, uh, yesterday, in fact, but um, antibiotics and snake bites. Now, are they recommended? It's a sort of a, uh, an ambiguous question because there isn't a clear answer. Um, what I can say is that there have been three randomized control trials that I know about, perhaps there are more, one of which was conducted in India, one in Brazil, and one in, um, in the Caribbean region. Looking at the role, it was a so randomized control trial. So some people were randomized to antibiotic prophylaxis, and a group was randomized to no antibiotics, placebo. And they found that the, um, the two groups had no difference in the development of, of, of infection post snake bite. The, the actual antibiotic chosen in each case varied. One was uh, ampicillin sulbactam, one was um, augmentin or amoxicillin flavulanic acid, and the third one was chloramphenicol. Um, but in all three groups, there was, there was no, no difference. Um, we, do, we can all recognize, we will have all seen it, that there is a challenge in distinguishing between a bacterial infection, a bacterial cellulitis, from the local cytotoxicity. There is often limb swelling, limb warmth, regional lymph lymphadenopathy. So that they're all features that you know, are common to both diagnoses. So I can understand it's difficult, but um, as Dr. Ravika told me, and in my experience as well, it's, it's, it's rare to see a fulminant bacterial sepsis following sepsis. In fact, I've never seen it. I, I, I am aware of the literature that people have developed abscesses that required debridement, but, you know, a clear separation around the bite site, sepsis, or in fact, bacteremia is incredibly uncommon. And um, there, there is a biological plausibility that perhaps infection may be more common in bites that result in a lot of cytotoxicity and necrosis, for example, cobra. Um, and I guess that the plausibility being if there is dead tissue, that is an environment that may encourage bacterial growth, perhaps an anaerobes and, and gram negative bacteria. Um, just on this point of infection, one thing that I find interesting, uh, I'm an infectious disease doctor and a microbiology doctor, is when there is infection there, what are the actual bacteria causing the infection? Um, is it your normal organisms that cause skin soft tissue infections like Staphylococcus aureus or Streptococci, group A Streptococci? No, no, it's not. And most commonly from the literature, when you look, the organisms that are being cultured from abscess or from blood cultures, as, as I say, this is very rare. They typically think uh, organisms such as Morganella morganae, Aeromonas, Enterococci, these are not organisms that cause bacterial infection in, in a cellulitis, they're not. But they are interestingly the same bacteria that are commonly cultured from the, from the oral flora of a snake. So there, there is, if you are going to give treatment for suspected infection following a, a snake bite, it's worth bearing in mind what organisms are you wishing to cover? Because um, augmenting, is not likely to cover or Morganella that harbors a, a chromosomal amp C. Um, same with Aeromonas. So um, personally, I advocate no, no empirical antibiotics or antibiotic prophylaxis, but close monitoring, looking for evidence. I, I've said personally because I actually don't know what the common practices across the medical units. So there will be some, uh, you know, the, there is a role of debate in, in, in all of the subjects that I touch upon in this talk. So um, case two, hot off the press. Um, and I, some of you may well have been involved in, in the 
discussions around this case. So an army officer stationed in Nagaland in India, northeast India, was bitten by a snake, presented to his local hospital with pain, swelling at the bite site and a positive 20 minute whole blood clotting test. Now I can assume that we all know what 20 minute whole blood clotting test means. So it's a, it's a bedside test for coagulopathy. So the patient was administered 20 vials of antimenin. However, the clotting remained deranged after 12 hours. What are you going to do about that? Anyone got any suggestions? So my approach to this would be either there is ongoing envenoming and the, well, no, it's suggestive of ongoing envenoming. Either the antivenom you are given is insufficient and has been only partially effective, or the antivenom that you've given has been ineffective because it's not active against the snake that's bitten this patient. But the second thing to say is um, the clotting being remains after 12 hours. By what method have you detected that clotting? And should is there a role for laboratory-based clotting? So this, this case sort of highlights the importance of knowing your local snake fauna. That is, what are the snakes ca causing the bites in your local area? Um, and that, by that, I mean not just the venomous snakes. It's also important to know the common non-venomous snakes. Because if a patient brings in a, a rat snake with them, it says this is the bit, you can immediately um, reassure that patient. So you, you don't need to be a herpetologist, but common knowledge of five or six snakes will go a long way for either raising concern or, um, or easing the patient's anxiety. So um, is the snake available to examine? Don't leave the snakes in with the patient's uh, relatives unexamined. They are a valuable tool of information. We can learn a lot by looking at the snake. So in this case, yes, the snake was brought with them. Um, do we recognize what that snake is? My answer would be no, I don't. It doesn't look like a the boy Russell on and a Russell's viper, I can say as much. It's got a triangular head, so I'd be thinking that possibly is a viper. But if in doubt, phone a friend. Yep, and that applies to everything in medicine, right? You, you don't just go blindly thinking, perhaps this is the right way. So, you, you know, you ask a senior, or in the case of this, you phone the Poison Information Centre. So within India, it's increasingly recognised that there are other medically important snake species beyond those that are covered by the polyvalent antivenom. Now there are many companies that make polyvalent anti antivenom, but they are all essentially a very similar product. They are derived from, the, the antivenom are derived from four different snake species. So Russell's viper, common crate, uh, spectacle cobra, and uh, saw scale viper. But we know that there are actually other species causing envenoming in India, and there is likely to be have limited cross reactivity of um, polyvalent antivenom against these other snake species that are, are, are now recognized as causing envenoming. So I've mentioned a few sort of groups. So uh, trim uh, the Trimerosaurus um, family, so that they will commonly be called green pit vipers. Um, uh, there, there, there are boreal snakes living in trees. Um, I understand that there's quite a few case descriptions in Kerala in the Western Ghats. Um, mountain pit viper, which if anyone has recognized it, this is what this snaker is. So Evophus uh, monticola um, and pump nose pit viper. So Hypnali Hypnali or Hypnali um, genera. So um, the actual patients in this in this real life case received a hundred um, a hundred vials of antivenom, but there should surely be a point where alarm bells. This is not working, and um, there is very good reason why it didn't work because the, the antivenom was not intended to work against this snake, the mountain pit viper. So there are some current, there are some problems with the current antivenom production in India. Now, 
This is not unique to India, I should add. Anti-venom production is expensive. It's time consuming. Um, but And it, it requires a lot of steps to be uh, performed well in order to get a good product at the end. So there are there has been some concern about the, the animal husbandry. So just to summarize how anti-venom is made, so you need to collect snakes. You need to milk those snakes to collect their venom. You then inoculate the venom into usually a, a large mammal. Most commonly that would be a, a horse in non-lethal doses. The horse then undergo, undergoes venesection uh, where you are taking the blood from the horse, take, uh, extracting the antibodies and putting the blood back into the horse, hopefully sustaining that horse's life. Um, then the, the antibodies undergo fractionation to separate the specific antibodies that you're wanting. Now, um, that requires quite a lot of standardization. And what we would really like is for an antivenom product to say, this antivenom contains a minimum amount of antibody and it will neutralize a minimum amount of venom. Um, I know that, I don't know specifically in India, but it, that is a problem all around the world, that there is limited standardization. And so from one batch to the next batch of antivenom, there will be quite a lot of variability. So variability within the region of two or three times potency or two or three times less potency. So just because um, you, you're giving the, the Uh, that might not be effective. Um, now, the other thing to say is that the, the, the snakes that are used to create the antivenom in India are all uh, collect, collected from Tamil Nadu. But the snakes, the Russell's viper of Tamil Nadu, vary dramatically from those in West Bengal to Rajasthan, to Pakistan, to Bangladesh, where this antivenom is still used. So um, even within species, you get interspecies variation in venom, um, and that also poses a challenge. One way to mitigate that would be to collect snakes and therefore venom from a variety of different locations across India, so you're becoming more sort of um, varied with your composition. This is a sort of a pictorial representation of exactly what I've just said. So if you think about a cobra species, one, two, three, the dominant cobra species across the country actually varies. So in, um, in the east, northeast, uh, northeastern states, West Bengal, Nyakalthia is typically the dominant cobra species, uh, whereas on, you know, uh, in the other parts of the Indian subcontinent, Naya Naya spectacle cobra would be more, more dominant. And if you look on the right, this is, um, firstly, venom is incredibly complex. Venom is not just one anti antigen. It contains, it contains a huge variety of proteins and peptides. So if you look at this, uh, this wheel, um, this is the Naya Naya from Maharashtra, it's got a, a big variety of diff so each different segment represents a different protein family, but the, the protein family distribution is, is, in, is very different to that of, for example, the Nyakalthia from West Bengal, but you're expecting the antivenom to work similarly effective. It's not, and that just goes to show you. And in the same, uh, uh, looking at the, the crates, so different crate species dominate in different parts of, of, of India, and again, the, the venom composition varies dramatically. Again, it would not be a surprise that the antivenom efficacy varies for those. And lastly, Echis. So um, for the saw scale viper, it's now commonly recognized that this subspecies of Echis carinatus, the Sotureki, um, is, is more dominant in Rajasthan. And in fact, that's one of the the most common snake species within Rajasthan. It's got completely different um, uh, venom composition. So um, going back to that case, so how do we assess coagulopathy? So we, we talked briefly about the 20 minute whole blood clotting test. Now it's a crude test, isn't it? You do it, it can be done all over India. You need very few um, bits of equipment, a syringe, 
a, a needle, a syringe, and a glass test tube. That's basically it, and a, and a stopwatch. Um, but how effective is that at identifying a coagulopathy? Bearing in mind it was sort of uh, derived within the field as a sort of, this is the only thing we've got available, so let's see if it works. So um, uh, a systematic review that I was involved with has, show, has pulled together data from about 15 different studies. And the, the sort of, the bottom line is, is that it has around about an 83% sensitivity at detecting an INR greater than 1.4 or a fibrinogen less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. So 83% sensitivity. That means you're going to be missing one in five people or thereabouts. Now it does. it is a little bit more specific. So 92% specific. That still means that 10% of the people that are positive will have a false positive result. So it is. it has its fallacies. It has it, it, it there are problems with the 20 minute block whole blood clotting test. And you should be thinking about that when you are trying to interpret the results. You also will know uh, that it is a binary test. It's not a clotting time, it's a clotting test. So we've all encountered people that, you know, the clotting time is seven minutes. No, no, it's, it's not a, a time. The answer is yes or no, positive or negative. So, um, the way I see the role of the 20 minute whole blood clotting test may, may differ from that from the professors in the room, but I would suggest 20 minute whole blood clotting test is incredibly quick. I would do that for all patients on admission, but I would also send it alongside a laboratory based clotting test. For example, a, an, an INR and a fibrinogen. The reason for sending both is that there are delays to getting the results for those laboratory clotting tests. 20 minute whole blood clotting test is done at the bedside. It gives you a rapid answer. But for those patients where, for example, the 20% of patients that it's going to miss, that will hopefully then be detected on the lab. So you're, you're using them together to try to bridge across some of the, uh, the uh, areas where the 20 minute whole blood clotting test sort of lets us down a little bit. And then, a common question is, well, what about a, a bedside, a, a point of care INR test? Wouldn't that be great? I had the same thoughts. I thought that that would be really fantastic. But unfortunately, the substrate that is used within the current point of care INR tests are affected by um, the venom and uh, renders them basically not useful, not at present. There are many, many, uh, when there were two, two different points of care um, INR tests have been tested and found to be useless. One of which was Abbott, the second one I can't recall the name or the, the, the company. But um, I know there is a group going to look at many more different um, manufacturers because more have become available, but I, they all share a similar mechanism. So I don't think it's likely to have a different result. So bring us on to the question of, so ignoring the case where this was in fact a snake not covered by the antivenom, now envisage yourself in front of a patient where you're in CMC velour, where you're strongly suspecting this is a Russell's Viper. Um, uh, when should further vials of antivenom be given? So just put some considerations here. So firstly, the time to antivenom first dose and also venom reversal is really important at reducing complications and there's a there was a study performed by um a, uh, david warrell and colleagues in in myanmar that closely correlated the, the time to anti-venom with the likelihood of developing acute kidney injury and for every hour that there is a delay in giving that first dose of antivenom, there is a statistically increased chance of developing an AKI. So it's important. It's important to get that first dose in early, and it's important to get the venom reversal done early. But assessing whether antivenom dose has been uh, effective is difficult, isn't it? We know the mechanism by which coagulopathy occurs with snake bite. It, it's typically a venom induced consumption coagulopathy. So even, even if all of your venom has been reversed or um, neutralized, 
you still require the time for your liver to generate sufficient clotting factors for you then to form a clot. And how long is that time? We actually don't know. We don't know the answer to that reliably. Um, so there's some very, 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 very sort of crude um, evidence that would suggest that in patients giving a super normal dose of antivenom. So for example, in India, uh, the typical starting dose would be 10 vials. In patients given 50 vials, it, this, was, this study was done in Myanmar, um, where you, you, you're giving a supra normal dose of antivenin. Within six hours, all of those patients had, had reversed their abnormal 20 minute whole blood clotting test. So that is where the idea that six hours is the right time to assess. But there is increasingly, there, are, there is more evidence now coming out that even in patients that have got no further clinical evidence of systemic envenoming, so cessation and spontaneous hemorrhage, cessation in the local cytotoxicity, and the normalization of hemodynamic stability, patients still can take longer for their INR, fibrinogen, and 20 minute whole blood clotting test to, to normalize. So I've not really answered this question very well here. What I have said, it's very difficult. Um, my approach is that the most critical assessment is your clinical assessment. If there is ongoing clinical evidence of envenoming, by which I mean the hemodynamic instability, active hemorrhage, new, uh, new features of envenoming, for example, has the patient now developed neurotoxicity, um, then I would give further doses. But based on a positive 20 minute whole blood clotting test alone, I would have caution for that. The other thing that may be of benefit, so is, is the INR, if, you're, if you have it available, is that actually trending down? Because if it's trending down, you know that the patient will have had to have developed more clotting factors. So, in my mind, that would be suggestive of reversal of venom. But um, perhaps we can ask Professor uh, Anna and Professor Rabrika for their opinion on this question at the end, because I, I think it's, it's, it's an area that could be looked at in much more detail and is not easily answered by scientific studies either. So um, what is the optimal dose of antivenom? What's the optimal initial dose of antivenom? Now, um, most um, uh, drugs have an S-shaped S um, efficacy curve. So you have a period where um, you're increasing your dose, but there is a there's a very limited effect. Um, you then enter this um, uh, so, sort of exponential rise where just a small increase in the dose of antivenom it results in a, a much a greater number of people having the desired outcome. Um, and then once you get to a certain level, for this is a hypothesis, by the way, so this is not a definitive answer. Once you get to a certain level, for example, maybe in, in Indian antivenom, that might be 20 vials, there is a plateau. And any more antivenom is in fact not going to cause you any further efficacy. So um, it should also be highlighted that there is also uh, uh, expected to be a dose-related toxicity reaction, and that's demonstrated by the, these green lines. So the more antivenom you give, you, give, you are more likely to have an anti adverse reaction. So where does this, where is the true curve for this in uh, Indian antivenom? The answer we don't know. There's never been an effective dose finding antivenom study. Hopefully it will happen in future, but uh, this remains a question. So um, the optimal dose of antivenom will remain unknown for the time being. So this is a case uh, that I came across uh, many years ago, but uh, it has some good learning points. So a 45 year old female presented to a local, uh, uh, it was a missionary hospital in West Bengal into the ED department with, with foot pain and swelling. And uh, she was collecting teak leaves in the local forest. Uh, and she thinks that she stepped on a thorn one hour previously. 
It was seen by another doctor who described her leg as looking toxic and it was admitted to hospital with some antibiotics and a tetanus uh, vaccine. So I saw the patient several hours later, you know, on the after, in the evening ward round, and um, she was complaining of abdominal pain and had slurred speech. So it didn't really fit for me with stepping on a thorn. Uh, and bearing in mind I'm talking about snakes today, it's probably a snake bite. So um, how are we going to clinically assess whether this patient's been envenomed or not? Well, going back to the basics, firstly, a 20 minute whole blood clotting test, which was available, a lab clotting test was not available. But interestingly, the 20 minute whole blood clotting test, uh, when, it, when, we, when we did it was, was positive, there was no clot. We then, or I then performed a comprehensive neurological review. So thinking about the types of neurotoxicity within snake bites. So um, neurotoxins within snakes can broadly be divided into alpha neurotoxins and beta neurotoxins, and they act slightly separately. So alpha neurotoxins are exclusively seen in elapid snakes. By elapid snakes, I mean um, crates, cobras, taipans, um, uh, whereas beta neurotoxins can be seen in some elapid snakes, for example, in, in crates, pungaris, um, genera, but um, are also seen in some viper species. For example, some distributions of the Russell's viper will develop neurotoxicity, and also some uh, European vipers will also give you some neurotoxicity. So uh, why is that important? Well, um, alpha neurotoxins uh, pre predominantly affect the postsynaptic, the neuromuscular junction, and they affect the postsynaptic. Now, if, um, if you uh, are, it, you know, if there is a delay to neuro uh, reversal or antivenom treatment, uh, the postsynaptic um, neuromuscular junction can be irreversibly damaged and the period of intubation for these patients can be very very long whereas in in the beta neurotoxins it tends to be pre synaptic well pre and post synaptic but there is a role for um uh, for antivenom and shorter periods of intubation so um it uh, the, the effect is typically seen in the smaller muscle groups first, and you'll be aware of that. So um, there, there has been a recent paper that tries to grade the neurotoxicity, and I think it's quite a good grading system. Uh, the reason why they brought this in, it, it, it's, an, it's, a, it's very similar to previous grading system, but um, I think it has some uh, you know, useful points to it. So grade zero would, would suggest no weakness. Grade one would have mild cranial nerve deficit, for example, ptosis, uh, but no bulbar weakness. Um, grade two, um, that, that would be classified as unable to lift the limbs or neck against gravity and difficulty swallowing, um, inability to ambulate independently. Grade three, uh, severe weakness causing ventil uh, uh, reduced ventilatory function and grade four is complete paralysis. So um, the process of neurotoxicity is a dynamic and it can, it, the neurotoxicity, um, what I was trying to get at in the previous pages, it can progress even after antivenom um, administration. So we need to monitor these patients very, very quickly. Um, in uh, very, very closely within the first 24 hours. And typically looking at bulbar, bulbar function because that is suggestive of um, uh, potential respiratory compromise. Um, commonly in Russell's Viper and crates, the period of um, intubation is very short, but remember patients will should will will typically retain consciousness so they will be able to hear what you're saying they'll be able to feel painful stimuli and they'll be able to feel anxiety so it's really important that these patients are given sedatives or for example ketamine um to to try to reduce them that uh, otherwise you can expect these patients will have post-traumatic stress disorder after after um after waking up um and then, yeah, in delays to antivenom and alpha neurotoxicity, it can 
result in very prolonged periods of intubation. Um, this slide um, demonstrates many of the complications that can be seen in, in a variety of different snake envenoming. These will be common to what you, you, you will be seeing day in, day out. So systemic hemorrhage and cardiovascular shock, hemostatic um, alterations such as venom-induced consumption coagulopathy, myocardial damage, so raised troponins, poor contractility, reduced ejection fraction, acute kidney injury from a variety of different mechanisms, um, local tissue damage, whether that be necrosis, limb swelling, um, and, um, and myotoxicity, so rhabdomyolysis. What's not covered in that diagram is some more other complications that I think we also need to be thinking about as well. So has the, uh, in Myanmar, Acute and chronic pituitary failure is really quite a common complication of Russell's Viper. Now, I appreciate that they have a different type of Russell's Viper in, um, in Myanmar, but um, patients with um, uh, you know have a low threshold for testing pituitary function. It normally became apparent on follow-up, um, but um, yeah, but it is uh, something to bear in mind. Now, capillary leak syndrome is, is a fascinating complication of Russell's Viper and venoming, and, and the etiology of this is really poorly understood. Uh, I understand that you don't see very many cases of capillary leak syndrome, if any, at all in in um, Velour, but it is commonly described in Kerala and in Pondicherry. So this is a complication where you have a generalized capillary leak resulting in pleural effusions, ascites, chemosis, parotid gland swelling, but there's an incredibly difficult to manage the intravascular fluid depletion and the case fatality of capillary leak syndrome is close to 50%. Um, cardiac toxicity and arrhythmias is, is really an under-investigated um, an area and actually something which probably would benefit from, you know, a thesis to look at that in itself, because um, are we misinterpreting transient cardiac to toxicity in Russell's Viper patients? Possibly that might contribute to the hemodynamic instability. Adrenal insufficiency, cerebrovascular events, and the neuropsychiatric complications that may occur after envenoming. So th there are some exciting developments. Um, so there is an improved antivenom um, product with, with reportedly greater potency and fractionation. Um, that needs to be trialed, but that's a development that should herald uh, you know, improved antivenom within India. Um, hopefully the an antivenom dose finding trial that I've alluded to earlier might finally answer that question about what is the optimal initial dose. But just to touch upon 10 vials, where does that come from? Why, why, do, why do we use 10 vials? Well, the, the evidence to support the current initial dose is based on animal models, um, the amount of antivenom it takes to reverse the venom within a mouse. Now, mice poorly represent human models, and there is a, there is a, you know, a desperate need to replicate well-designed dose-finding trials in humans. And then um, there's a, a number, a number of different um, uh, therapies that will individually target specific toxin families. And there's there's one uh, drug which is currently in trial within India um, called verasplodib. Now, ver verasplodib is an anti-phospholipase A2, and it was brought to market initially in the US as a drug that they thought would be very, very beneficial for cardiac stabilization following myocardial infarction because it's um, there's phospholipid A2s apparently are involved in the cardiac remodeling. Now, in a big randomized control trial, a phase three control trial, it had no effect on the cardiac remodeling following uh, uh, cardiac events. However, it was safe. There was very, very few side effects. 
So someone's had the idea that, well, phospholipid A2s are a really prominent role in snake bites. They cause many of the complications or contribute to some of the complications that we see in Russell's Viper. So can we use this drug, which is available as an oral form that we know is uh, safely tolerated as a potential adjunct to antivenom treatment? Possibly. We should find out soon because the trials are ongoing. And there's so much more to learn. So um, I've included a few slides about um, how I got involved in snake bite research and, um, and then a little bit about research and how you may wish to get involved yourself. Um, so this is um, the hospital that my wife and I went to about 10, 11 years ago. It's called Kustaya Siva Nikitan. It's in... Uh, rural West Bengal uh, and that's I went there with the intention to see lots of infectious diseases um, and potentially or almost certainly we did see lots of infectious diseases but we, we couldn't diagnose most of them because the laboratory support was very very limited but you don't need laboratory you don't need much laboratory support for snake bite management it's mostly clinical and bedside laboratory tests and um, I found the multi-system involvement of snake bite fascinating. It can affect all parts of the me medicine. It's a real general medicine um, management. And that's how I first saw snake bite and got intrigued by it. Um, after returning to the UK um, uh, to do my sort of core medical training and membership exam, we then, again, uh, Vasundra and I went to um, to Bangladesh. This is Chittagong Medical College Hospital in in um, in Bangladesh, and we we actually went there to conduct a, a study in organophosphate poisoning. But it's a it's a big centre for snake bites. Many many Trimerosaurus albolabris bites. It's so a green pit viper. Quite a lot of cobra bites, Nyakalthia, um, were seen in this hospital. They 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 get about 450 to 500 snake bite cases a year, um, and they don't have antivenom available for those green pit vipers. But um, so I spent a year there, and re really, uh, I mean, this is a, probably a common image for you for government hospitals. You know, mattresses beside beds, mattresses in the corridor. Um, but uh, it was a really wonderful experience. It, working there and the, the, the clinicians were very knowledgeable and very welcoming. Um, but then um, again, I returned and started my uh, infectious disease microbiology training program. And throughout this period, I continued to retain interest in snake bite. Uh, I worked with some colleagues on 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 uh, some publishing some data in, in the UK about our one venomous snake, which is really not very venomous at all, but I still, you know, wanted to tell people about that. So we published a, a, a paper about our viper in the UK, the Adder, um, and through uh, attending meetings, just publishing some case series, and um, uh, I, I was made, um, I was put in touch with, with you know, some of the world experts, um, like David Worrell. It's... Um, it's an incredibly small field, snake bite. Once you start showing an interest, you know, asking whether is, is there a role for us to write this paper up? Can I do a literature review? You suddenly access different fields. And um, I never set out with the intention to become a researcher. It was just something I found interesting. I had a passion for it because I felt that these patients are genuinely neglected. Um, so speaking to people with uh, experience allows you then to get involved in clinical trials like the one in, in Myanmar, which unfortunately was cut short because of political instability. But uh, that's, that's another question, that's another for another time. So I think this possibly is the last slide. So um, my advice for thinking about research is stems from your clinical question, your clinical work. So question the clinical evidence supporting a guideline. So um, why do we give 10 vials of antivenom? Look into that. Has there been clinical studies to, to, to compare different um, doses? Were those trials conducted in a scientific manner? Does it raise questions at the end of those trials? And can we answer those questions? When you're reading literature, 
don't take the findings reported in the literature as, as gospel. Don't accept that their conclusions are correct. Use a critical appraisal um, method. And there are tools out there, which you may or may not be available, such as the CASP tool, that can guide you through critical appraisal. It can see whether the findings in their study is relevant to your scenario, your, your environment. Um, think about the hierarchy of evidence. If you ask one of your seniors, well, why exactly are we treating this patient with one week of um, amphotericin B? Because in, in our experience at CMC, that, that seems to work. That's actually very low hierarchy of evidence. Despite that being an esteemed professor or whoever, that is you know very low. But if they come back to say, well, there is a Cochrane review that demonstrates the superiority of this thing, then you're, you know, you can be quite confident that you've actually, you're doing the best. So think about what is the evidence that's guiding this treatment and can we improve upon that? Um, think critically and, pro and propose scientific questions. When you start to think like this, there's literally scientific questions, studies that could be done on everything. Um, not that that's practical and I don't propose like that the first step in in research is to, to, to do a multi-center randomized control trial. That would be ludicrous. It's a huge amount of work. Start small, don't be too ambitious, but genuinely question the rationale for clinical decision-making. Um, there is funding available, um, both locally and internationally, and the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene offer a small grants program small grants program for tropical medicine and snake bites um they are they are available they come available twice a year up to five lakh um and you know i know people personally that have been awarded these grants um so speak to your seniors if you've got a study idea they can help uh guide you through the decision the the, the process and um the fundamentally the most important thing is you have to be personally interested in your scientific question. You have to genuinely be excited by your subject. Otherwise, you'll find it a drag, a bore, uh, a burden. And you never want that because often research is on top of your clinical work and we are all working close to maximum anyway. So if you are going to pursue something academically or in research, make sure it's something that you genuinely are um, interested in. And um, today I joined the ID team on the um, consult service. Um, and there was a case of, of uh, subacute uh, adrenal histoplasmosis. I've never seen that before. That is a rare condition in the UK. In fact, frighteningly rare, but I believe it's common here. So what could we do for a research? This is, sorry, I'm trying to find an example about how we can think critically about um, an everyday problem, because seemingly histoplasmosis is an everyday problem. What are the actual clinical features? How do these people present? Is that well described in the literature? What are the risk factors for, are there any risk factors? What is the reliability of the urinary histoplasma antigen? Has that be definitively tested? Can we test that here? What is the optimal treatment? How long should we give intravenous amphotericin B? How long should we give it oral itraconazole for? Um, and can we think about shortening those or bringing them, um, yeah, altering those? Um, and can we improve, reduce toxicity, simplify, make it cheaper without affecting outcome? All of those questions were going through my head when, I, when we were thinking about a patient on am amphotericin B. Um, where it perhaps isn't guided by, you know, it's, it's, it's something which is not, you know, very well described in the literature. Um, and, you know, we can, we can tackle this for almost every medical condition. You know, there are questions that, that remain unanswered that we could think critically about. So that's the end. Um, I'm very welcome to take any questions. Uh, I appreciate it's sort of quite a haphazard talk, uh, but um, yeah, I hope there's been something of interest. Thank you.
that any questions are very welcome, uh, whether it be on a subject matter on here or anything else uh, related to my training or training in the UK or anything like that, you feel free to ask me. Ask me. What I'll do is as well is put the first slide on. It's got my email address down there. So if you do want to write to me about anything, you can just feel free. Um, So you mentioned that renal insufficiency is one of the rare complications. Yeah. How was that? Was that acute or chronic? Did you see it long term? So personally, I've not seen it. It, it is something which is seen in um, Myanmar following Russell's viperphenamine. And there's uh, in mortality studies, both in India and, more, and in mostly in Myanmar, there has been... Um, uh, evidence of adrenal necrosis on autopsy. So whether they are clinically significant or not, I don't know, but there has certainly been cases described in the literature by David Warrell and colleagues um, about an acute uh, adrenal insufficiency. So I guess refractory hypotension, uh, electrolyte abnormalities, perhaps thinking about can we do a synactin test? We are the center that we are in the snake bite case and tourniquet has been applied. So we know that the tourniquet has been applied in a graded manner, provided monitor. But do you recommend to apply tourniquet or not to apply tourniquet? No, I, I wouldn't apply a tourniquet myself uh, because of the potential complications you might develop. Even though you as a clinician will apply a tourniquet that won't be arterial occlusive, I would still not do it. There's not evidence to support or refute it. It's not, it's not conclusive. And for that reason, I wouldn't do it. Um, yeah. I just have a, a small comment on, on your slide on the neurotoxin. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I think there. I, I I think there's a minor switch uh, of the two toxins. Okay. Um, which could cause some confusion. Yeah. The, the beta neurotoxins are basically fossil hydrases. so they act presynaptically and they destroy the axon. So the paralysis is usually for a much longer time. Oh, I beg your pardon. Uh, yeah. In contrast to the alpha neurotoxins, which are the which are non-enzymatic, and they are three-finger toxins yeah. which act on the acetylcholine receptors, they don't they don't cause structural damage. So it's the the opposite of what it's I've said. The opposite. Of what I've said. I, but I, thank you for for identifying that. Okay, thank you for coming.